plantations are just another crop which you're growing for commercial use, supplying the country with wood and timber reserves, um, you know, resources. So it just comes down to a trade-off. How much water are you prepare, prepared to use to grow your timber? And in my view, that's where the forest industry has not been kind to itself. They should have gone in there and said, yes, we do use water, we convert it into money and jobs. Tr trees will use, you know, 50 litres a day, um, a reasonably sized stand of, of trees that are between five and seven years old or older. Eucalyptus can use 100 litres a day, but it will range anything up to 1,000 litres a day. Pines are smaller and they don't grow as fast, so they will use anything from 50 to 600, perhaps, litres per day. It depends where in the landscape it is. Trees right next to a stream, a rule of thumb, will use twice as much as a tree further upslope because it has more access to groundwater. But it depends on the size of the tree. So the bigger the tree and the faster growing it is and the bigger the canopy, the more water it uses. Eucalypts grow a lot faster than pines. So when you plant up an area to eucalyptus plantation, you will see a response in terms of declining stream floods within the first two years. Because in two years, you've got a canopy that's three meters, you know, high. Uh, pines will take longer, five years. And eucalyptus will reach their peak uh, water use between 10 and 15 years. After that, they're pretty big trees and their water use will stop declining. It's still at a pretty high rate, but the rate has, has changed and now the water use is declining as the tree just puts on mass but doesn't grow its canopy anymore. Pines take longer and will you'll see peak water use about age 20 years. So if we, we like to construct these simple mathematical models and say so just to try and in, in doing hydrological modeling understand how pines and eucalyptus affect different areas. Age is an important factor. Now what happens in commercial plantations is you never you never cut out your whole forest all at once and you never plant your whole forest all at once. And the point about that is you want to establish what they call a normal forest, which means that you, you can obtain a sustainable supply of wood over the years. So you're cutting out a certain proportion and you're planting. And if it's a eucalyptus, then you could say that you're going to cut one fifteenth every year. And if it's pines, one twentieth every year because they've reached their peak um, wood production. Because water use is associated with biomass that has been put on. And if trees are not putting biomass on as fast as they were, then it's time to harvest them. Now, if you're planning a forest in a landscape, what you would really want to do in your catchment is, is have a total normal forest in each catchment so, so that any stream will, will only feel the effects of planting of, you know, one twentieth or one fifteenth every year and harvesting that. But normally, that's not always possible for operational reasons because your forest estate is no respecter of hydrological boundaries. So there's a bit of mix and match. But the, the trick, depending on how you are organizing your forest, is if you're organizing it for wood production, then you know, you've got one set up. If you're trying to be sensitive to the hydrological effect as well, then you would try and... and manipulate your forest age in each of the catchments to be as normal as possible. Some of the species here are quite invasive. Okay, and the Pinus radiata, fairly invasive, as is um, Pinus pinasta. And the, the issue there is that they seed themselves and they, they have a fire-driven ecology, so that Fire sweeping through encourages them to release seeds from their cones and, and you get a massive invasion. So they handle the southwestern Cape especially um, environment very well because it's a fire-driven ecology here too. If you look at higher levels in the peaks around here, you'll see pines even up on the ridge. You know, So the seeds blow up there and they establish themselves. And the issue around these pines, especially in the western Cape, is that they have a much higher biomass, in other words, fuel load, in the landscape than indigenous fynbos. 
So when you get a fire in, the, the heat generated by the wildfire is much, much hotter than a natural fire, which damages the soils. And you can't see it very well today, but earlier this year, in February, we had a big wildfire. When the fire came through, there was a strong southeaster behind it, and because of the high biomass provided by the trees, temperatures and fire intensity were very high. So that had the unfortunate effect of cooking the soil to a certain extent, which destroys the, the topmost carbon material in the soil and creates hydrophobic soils. It will run straight off. And when that happens, you get enormous uh, kinetic energy generated and the erosion is just enormous. Aliens in the Western Cape, where they gen in, in a fire-dominated landscape, are bad for the soil and the hydrology. And, you know, one would rather not have them for that reason. Eucalyptus also spread. In the rest of the country, the fire isn't such an issue, but their water use is, and you especially get a lot of eucalyptus species lining the major river channels. And if you look around in the Western Cape on the Berg River, on the Rifius on the end, um, and further north, you get, you'll just see absolute lines of huge eucalyptus. So you must know what that's doing to water resources in that area. In further north, in KwaZulu-Natal and Pumalanga and the higher areas, the black wattle, the Casio Mensa invasion is enormous. And that's probably one of the most serious invaders that we have. And it's uncontrollable at the moment. Working for water, working very hard to control it. But the problem is so enormous that one has to wonder whether they'll ever get control over it. We've done a lot of the work, and the scientific work around plantations, but now things are moving into the impacts of climate change and what's going on. And because we've in had this catchment here intensely monitored over 70 years, we've got excellent records of rainfall at a smaller time resolution than the daily rainfall records that you get out of the normal weather station. And we've, we can see fairly clearly that, in this valley anyway, rainfall has been going down over the last 70 years. So much so that at the top of the valley, um, right at the top on the mountains, where we re we've recorded the highest rainfall in the country, 3,500 millimetres. That's three and a half metres of rain. We've lost, on average, 500 millimetres of that. And the important thing to remember in the Western Cape is that the mountains, because of their what we call orographic forcing, produce most of the water resources you know, that the rest of the lowlands use. So it's important to know what's going on in the mountains, and it's important to know if that's changing and how it's changing. That's what I would like to see continue. And that goes for high rainfall areas in the rest of the country, all along the Southern Cape Mountains, the, the Drakensberg, the Southern Drakensberg, and right up into the Limpopo province.